Hey, welcome back everyone. So last time we started to study ordinary least squares as one of the first methods of machine learning. We looked at how to optimize the square loss function. And we optimize this square loss function by taking the gradient of it and then setting it to zero. Um, we first did the painful way, did it the painful way, and we looked at um, all the partial derivative, derivatives of L, and we did everything in a scalar. Uh, we did everything using scalars, and finally we kind of used some pattern recognition to um, to notice that this is actually a matrix equation, and then we said that okay, this is actually uh, the optimal weights, the optimal W that we can have, x transpose x inverse x transpose y. So that was kind of painful. So next we started to work on a more convenient way of deriving the same thing by using matrix derivatives. So we're going to continue doing that this class. So last time uh, we also uh, so last time we took the first step of writing down the loss function in matrix vector form. So the loss function again is going to be the summation over the individual squared errors from every data point. So sum over i equals 1 to n of yi minus w transpose xi squared. So the first thing we did was we simply wrote, um, we kind of stacked all the input data as rows and then we stacked them on top of each other to make a matrix x. And then we stack the scalar output uh, also on top of each other, and then that gives us a vector y. So then, uh, basically, we used linear algebra facts, such as when you sum over something squared, that's actually the two norm. So we wrote the loss function in a two norm form, and then we expanded it um, because the two norm is actually the vector transpose itself. Okay, so now after we expanded it, this is what we got. So this is a loss function in matrix vector form. And we now need to take the gradient with respect to the vector w um, to see what we get. And then whatever we get, we set that to zero to determine what, the, uh, what w should be. So in order to do that, we actually need some more tools for matrix derivatives. So we talked a little bit about it the last time. Um, so we kind of went through it very quickly. So let me do just the first one very, very quickly. And then the rest of it, you have to go through on your own. Okay. So suppose we have Suppose we want to take the derivative or the gradient with respect to a vector x of a transpose x. So when we take the gradient, it's actually equivalent to taking all the partial derivatives of the function that you're taking the gradient of. So it's going to be partial x, partial over partial x1 of a transpose x vector still, right? So this is the function that we're taking the partial derivative of. And then we take the partial derivative with respect to x2, of the same function, and so on, all the way down to xn. So now it's actually pretty simple because a transpose x is just going to be the same as a, a1x1 plus a2x2 plus and so on until a n x n. So if you if I now take the partial derivative of this entire expression with respect to x1, you will see that only a1 will show up because all the other terms don't depend on x1. Similarly, when we take the partial derivative with respect to x2, then only a2 will show up. That's because a2x2 is the only term that involves x2. So this, this pattern continues, and we actually just get a1, a2, all the way up to a n, and that's exactly the vector a. So that's quite nice, right? So we took the gradient of this uh, 
kind of this dot product or the inner product. And the result we get is actually something similar to, um, very similar to what we would get if we actually differentiated in the scalar case, d by dx of ax, so that gives us a, right? So in the matrix form, it's actually the same. Um, a transpose x, when you take the gradient of that, you get the vector a. So that's really nice. And it turns out that a lot of the matrix derivatives will look very much like the scalar case. Okay, so that was the first one. Uh, for the so the second one is actually taking the Jacobian of a vector uh, of a vector function. So here x is a vector, so a matrix A times x will give us another vector. So basically ax is a function of multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Um, when you take the Jacobian with respect to x, so um, you basically you will actually uh, basically take all the different partial derivatives in the different rows and in the different columns. We're taking the partial derivatives of each component of the output vector, right? So this is the first column has the first component of ax, and then the last component has the nth component of ax. Working out, working this out in a very similar fashion as the a transpose x uh, up here, we actually just get that the answer is a transpose, right? So that's quite nice because it also looks like what we expect based on our experiences in the scalar case. Um, the only, I mean, the only thing to pay attention to in the vector and matrix cases is that, um, for example, you, you have a, a transpose here, and then when you take the gradient, the transpose goes away. And over here, you have ax with no transpose. When you take the, when you take the Jacobian, uh, you have a transpose showing up, right? So there's a I mean, just a little bit of difference, just be careful with the transpose. So we need basically a, a few more standard rules of matrix derivatives. Um, we need a sum rule so that this one is actually pretty simple. <coughs> right, you can take the, take the derivative or gradient um, or Jacobian term by term. So all of this works for uh, whether f has multiple or single output, right? So here in the most general form, I have written down f vectors. That means that the function f actually outputs a vector. We also need the familiar product rule. So uh, in a scalar case, it would simply be f, f times g. So now it's actually the vector f transpose vector g. And well, the, actually the product rule looks exactly like the product rule that we're familiar with. So um, derivative of f times g plus derivative of g times f, exactly the same. Okay, so actually um, this is really nice because one of the things that showed up in the, uh, in the loss function is, is while well, we have a linear term, so now we know how to take the gradient with respect to a linear, uh, for a linear term, right? But we also have a quadratic form here. So, so then we kind of need to know how to take the gradient of this term. So, <clears throat> so this is what we're doing down here. Okay, maybe we can just quickly write this down, just step by step. Okay, so we have the gradient uh, of this quadratic form. And actually, we can write it in a product form because this is exactly x transpose. That's the first factor of the product and then times ax, that's the second factor. So to be a bit more explicit, I'll write down x vector transpose, that's the first factor, and then ax is the second factor. So now we can use the product rule, which says that um, if we take the gradient of f, so in this case, no vector on the f, uh, sorry, actually there's a vector on the f, f transpose g, that's actually equal to, just take the derivative with respect to f times g plus uh, Sorry, so here actually the order is very important. In a scalar case, 
Uh, it didn't really matter which order you wrote G and F, but in the vector case, this is important. So actually the, uh, it's supposed to be a vector sign. So the Jacobian actually comes first and then the multiplication with the original function. So now applying this to our quadratic form here. So this is actually gonna be, uh, so a, So the first, the derivative of x times ax plus the, the Jacobian of ax times our x, like that. Okay, so actually the, the Jacobian of something with respect to itself is just identity times ax, and here, which we kind of looked at this already, uh, the Jacobian of ax, that gives us a transpose, and then times, uh, times x. So this is actually, in the end, we can factor out the x, and we get a plus a transpose x. So that's kind of interesting, actually, so in a scalar case, when we have a quadratic form, for example, ax squared, when we took the derivative, the two comes down, so, so then you get two ax. Um, in a matrix case, uh, we actually get a plus a transpose, so that's kind of like two a, right? But not quite, right? So it's a plus a transpose times x. So it's actually somewhat similar to the scalar case as well. So you can, so these are the most common ones that we'll be using. Um, you can look, look at a lot more on, on Wikipedia, right? So you don't really need to memorize them, but basically remember the, remember the common ones, like the ones we covered, right? The one with the inner product between constant vector and X, and then the matrix AX, and then the quadratic form. So these are the most common ones. And then for the other ones, refer to them as needed. Okay, so now we have all the tools to differentiate uh, this loss function and then setting it to zero. Okay, so let's do that here. Okay. So remember that we had the loss function was summation of i equals to one to n of our desired output minus our model prediction, which is w transpose xi squared. We did some math, and then this actually, and kind of, kind of convinced us our, ourselves that first of all, this is actually a two norm. So this is x, uh, matrix X times W, where X is a matrix of all the data points stacked uh, horizontally. And then Y was all the output data stacked, yeah, stacked vertically. And then we did some more math, and then so basically the first step we did, I'm gonna not I'm not gonna write down every step this time, but the first step we did was to notice that the two norm squared can also be written like this. So y minus xw transpose times y minus xw. And then after a while we got the final expression, which is y transpose y plus two y transpose um, x and then multiply by w plus finally w transpose x transpose x w transpose right so that was our um our final simplified or expanded expression of the loss function so now we're going to take take the gradient of this loss function with respect to w okay so actually, 
for the sake of neatness, let me write this over here. So we do it term by term. The first term is basically a constant because it does not involve w, so that gives us zero. Zero vector, remember the gradient is actually a vector. Plus, so here we have something multiplying w. So the gradient would, 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 be, would be the thing that multiplies w transpose so remember the transpose, right? So it kind of looks like um, it basically it basically looks like the scalar case, except that we have to remember the transpose. Okay. And then lastly, we have a quadratic form, right? Just to go up here, um, the gradient of a quadratic form is actually the matrix plus its transpose times the vector. So this is actually the matrix. The matrix is x transpose x plus its transpose. Well, actually, x transpose x, if you take the transpose, you go backwards and then transpose each, uh, each of the terms. So you have x transpose and then going backwards, x transpose transpose. That gives us back x. And then, and then uh, multiply by w. Okay, so just gonna work a little bit more here, just to simplify. So the first term zero, let's ignore that. Next, we have two, and then taking the transpose, we have x transpose y, and then plus two, x transpose x, w. So now we can kind of see, uh, we have something nice, right? Um, so setting the gradient to zero, right, setting, so this step is set gradient to zero, right? In this case, a zero vector. Okay, so we have zero vector equals two x transpose y plus two x transpose x uh, w. So now the two goes away, we divide by two on both sides. And then we actually have, um, I think I'm, yeah, there's actually a mistake here. So, so this plus was actually a minus. So this is actually a minus. So then we actually had a minus here. So now we can move this to the other side. So we, are, we actually have x transpose x w equals um, x transpose y. And if, and if x transpose x is invertible, then we have w equals x, uh, that's not a vector, that's a matrix, x transpose x inverse x transpose y, just like before. Okay, so basically you can kind of see that taking the gradient is much simpler if you do it using matrix derivatives. Um, so actually that's gonna be the way we do things from now on, right? We're not gonna go back to the really ugly uh, partial derivatives as we did before. So it's really important to know some of these. Okay, so this is actually, um, after we obtain W by setting the gradient to zero, this, is, this actually gives us the critical point of the loss function. And the critical point, as we have seen before, it could be either a local minimum a local maximum, or maybe even a saddle point. So remember that we're looking for a W that minimizes the loss function. So we will be hoping that it's actually a local minimum. To show that this W is actually a local minimum of L, um, we need to show that the, one of the ways, I guess, is to show that the loss function is a convex function. If we can show that, then any critical point would be a local minimum and also a global minimum. So that's what we're going to do next. Okay, so, so this is the gradient of the loss function. What we're going to do is actually we're going to take the Jacobian of the gradient that gives us the Hessian. And if we can show in the end that the Hessian is positive semi-definite, that means that the loss function must be convex. So let's do this. Okay, so let's just write down this step over here. So 
let's write it down nicely minus uh, 2 x transpose y actually maybe using the simplified after we got, got rid of all the transposes and extra terms so this step plus 2 x transpose x w okay so now we take another we take the Jacobian of this The first term is actually independent of W. So we actually have a zero matrix here. And then the second term has a matrix times a vector, right? So, so basically using the same property that we derived above, actually on the slides, um, we can see that whenever we have, we have a linear term, you basically have to take the transpose of this, uh, the coefficient essentially, transpose, right? So this is, so this is just going to be 2 and then x transpose going backwards with the transpose, um, x transpose, and then x transpose transpose. So that actually just gives us x transpose x, just as before. And last class, or maybe two classes ago, we showed that for any matrix, um, if you take a transpose multiplied by itself, then that is always going to be a positive semi-definite. Mm, excuse me. Okay, so that 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 means that when the, when the Hessian is positive semi-definite, so Hessian is positive semi-definite. Therefore, L is convex, and then therefore. This W that we got before, x transpose x inverse, x transpose y, uh, is a global minimum. So this, this choice of W indeed minimizes um, the loss function. Okay, great. So hopefully we are all glad that we didn't end up doing the, the Hessian using, uh, without using matrix derivatives. Okay, so back on the slides again. So basically we took it, we took the Jacobian of the gradient, right? So first we used the sum rule. So taking the Jacobian term by term. This term is independent of W. This term is linear in W, so we take the transpose of the coefficient, and then in the end we get x, two x transpose x, which is always positive semi-definite. Okay, so this shows that L is indeed a convex function, and therefore this uh, critical point minimizes the loss. So from now on, it's going to be called W star star for optimum. Okay. So a summary, so in ordinary least squares, our model is going to be y hat equals w transpose x. So we input, um, we pass some input to the model and we get a prediction y hat. The parameters or the unknowns that we, we would like to determine is the vector w. In order to find the best w, we define a loss function to be the sum of squares um, of the error between um, the actual output data and the, the predicted output. So plugging in what the predicted output is based on our model, we have this loss function over here. So sum from i equal one to n of yi minus w transpose xi squared. So the best w or the optimal parameters w star is going to be whatever w that minimizes the loss function. So the arg min over w of L of w, and we have calculated that to be x transpose x inverse x transpose y. And the way we did that was by taking the gradient of L with respect to w, setting that to zero to obtain this critical point. Then we took, another, we took the Jacobian of the gradient to get the Hessian of L, and because the Hessian is positive semi-definite, we know indeed that this W star um, actually is the global minimum of L. 
all of this was made much simpler by doing everything using matrix derivatives and stacking. And that was, um, so in order to do that, we had to stack up all the input data. Um, so we first took the transpose of all the input vectors and then stacked up, stacked them up uh, on top of each other to get a matrix X. We also stacked the output scalars on top of each other to get a vector Y. So, so basically, um, this is how you this is uh, how you can calculate this expression. So now some general terms. So what we have done so far, the process of finding W, the process of finding the optimal parameters, is called training. In our very first machine learning example, ordinary least squares, training involved what I just said, right? Setting the gradient of L to zero, verifying that the critical point is actually a minimum. So that's training in this simple example. There are other ways to do training as we'll discuss in the future, but this is one of the simplest ways to do training. Training gives us the optimal W star, and then we can use this W star in our model to make predictions, to make new predictions Y hat. So if we receive a new X, we can then calculate W star transpose X, and then we get a new Y hat, that's our prediction. So this process is called testing. Okay, so these are very general concepts that we'll be using um, even when we look at other models and other ways of doing training. Okay, and aside on the pseudo inverse, so this matrix, um, which multiplies y here, so x transpose x inverse x transpose, um, this is actually called a pseudo inverse. So this is actually denoted x dagger. So this is a plus sign with a with the bottom part being a little, a little longer, so that's called dagger. So, so this is kind of like a generalization of the inverse. Um, so you're gonna explore this a little bit more in your assignment. So when the number of data points, that's capital N, is equal to the number of input dimensions, and we would like to minimize y minus xw, well, y minus xw uh, actually could be equal to zero in this case. Um, so the, and that's because we can actually find a W such that XW equals to Y exactly. Um, because if the big N equals little N, then we have N equations here and N unknowns. So when you have N equations and N unknowns, you can actually find, uh, you can actually simply solve the system of equations. If X is full rank, then we have W star equals to X inverse Y. So X inverse basically solves this linear system of equations. Okay, so this is actually a very special case. When you have exactly the same number of data points and input dimensions, you can simply solve this uh, system of equations and the loss actually becomes zero. Well, that's not so typical, right? Um, more typically, you have much many more data points compared to the number of input dimensions. So you can't actually fit the data perfectly. So previously, um, we have looked at this general case and we saw that W star equals X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. So X, and then if we call the first part X dagger, so that's actually X dagger Y. So this kind of looks like X inverse Y, right? But not really inverse. Um, so that's why this is X dagger thing is called the pseudo inverse. And it can be seen, it can be seen as the generalization of the inverse to the case when, where the data cannot fit perfectly, which is actually the typical case. So in terms of linear algebra, then um, X dagger, the pseudo, the pseudo inverse is basically the operator that finds the best possible solutions to a linear system of equations that has no solution. So previously, when, when there is a solution, the minimum is zero, 
when there's no solution, the, the best you can do is to find a W that will satisfy Y minus X, that will minimize Y minus XW, right? So that's basically the same thing as satisfying uh, the difference being zero as best as possible. Okay, so X dagger basically finds the best possible solution even when there's no solutions. Best possible solution being defined by uh, minimizing this uh, this two norm here. Okay, so now how do we compute the inverse? Um, turns out that we can do it using SVD. So let's take a look. It's actually pretty simple, but I'll write it down. Okay, so. SVD is basically saying any matrix, any matrix can be written as um, kind of a sequence of transformations that we saw earlier, right? So we have a or orthogonal matrix times this uh, times sigma, the list of single values, and then we have another orthogonal matrix, uh, so U sigma V transpose. So now the pseudo inverse. X dagger is given by X transpose X inverse X transpose. So now we're just going to plug all of that in, right? So big open bracket and then U sigma V transpose transpose. So that takes care of the, that takes care of X transpose and then times X and all of that inverse. And then, sorry, instead of writing X, we need to, um, we need to write down the SVD of X transpose. So now we can kind of work on this bit by bit. So first let's just uh, write out the transpose. So we do it backwards as usual, taking the transpose of each term. So V transpose transpose sigma transpose, sigma is symmetric, and then u transpose, and then u sigma v, all of this inverse, and then u sigma, okay, so let's, we may as well do the transpose, right, move that in, v sigma and u transpose. Okay, so now something nice happens. Um, so because u, u is an orthogonal matrix, so u transpose is actually the inverse of u, right? So, so u is orthogonal, so u transpose equals u inverse, right? And u transpose u equals identity. So then we can simplify things a little bit. So for identity in here, we don't have to write it down. Identity doesn't really uh, doesn't really change anything. Okay, the rest of it, just gonna continue writing that down. So now we need to do the inverse of this thing in here. One trick for doing inverses of multiple things multiplied together is to do the inverse backwards. So we're going to do V transpose inverse, this sigma inverse, the next sigma inverse, and finally V inverse, and then V sigma U transpose. The reason we're doing, we can do all the inverses backwards is if you just imagine, um, if, if I can do some magic with the computer here, if you imagine this part, if you move it up here, right? You can kind of see that this V transpose will multiply V transpose inverse, that becomes identity. Okay, so maybe that's, that wasn't the best idea, it's kind of unclear. So can I copy this over here? And then maybe I can copy, copy this here, right? So to verify that 
this expression is indeed an inverse, we simply have to put them next to each other and just confirm that they do cancel, right? They do become identity. So here we have V transpose, V transpose inverse, that's identity. And then the next two, they cancel, next two cancel. And then finally V, V inverse, they cancel, they all cancel. So all, all this whole thing becomes identity. Okay, so that's something we can always do with inverses of uh, matrices multiplied to each other. Okay, so now, now we can also use the fact that V is orthogonal. So V inverse is just V transpose. So now, so everywhere when we had inverse, we transpose, right? Um, actually, maybe we don't even need this. Let's just work from the inside and just to look at where we have inverses multiplying the non-inverse of the same matrix. So that becomes identity. The sigma inverse becomes identity. Sigma inverse sigma becomes identity. And then you have what we have left is actually V transpose inverse, sigma inverse, and then U transpose. Okay, so turns out that V transpose inverse is just going to be V transpose transpose. Sigma inverse U uh, uh, U transpose. And then V transpose transpose just gives us V. So V sigma inverse U transpose. Okay, so again, you can, if you're, if, if you don't believe me that V transpose inverse is just V over here, you can verify by multiplying V and V transpose together because they're orthogonal. Um, they will become identity when you multiply them together. So, so V is indeed the inverse of V transpose. So if, so if X, basically if the original matrix X is full rank, then, then the pseudo inverse of X would be V sigma inverse U transpose. And the sigma inverse is simply just taking the diagonal elements of sigma and then doing the taking the reciprocal of each, each of those elements. So that basically lets us compute um, the pseudo inverse pretty easily. Right, so V, we already know um, this matrix inverse, that's pretty easy, right? Just the reciprocal of each component and then U transpose, we, we know U already, right? Okay, so this is the case when X is invertible. For the case that, uh, for the case where X is non, not invertible, so we kind of saw one case like this before. So when we first introduced uh, SVD, this is the example that we had, right? So when, when, uh, when the matrix X, now I'm calling it A, is not invertible, then A dagger is actually V sigma dagger U transpose. And sigma dagger is just taking the inverse or the reciprocal of all the non-zero elements of sigma. So in sigma here, we have, um, we only have one sing non-zero singular value here. We just have to take the reciprocal, reciprocal of that element down here. And then for all the, the, all the zeros, we just leave them. So that would be how we compute um, the pseudo inverse of any matrix, not necessarily invertible. So now let's complete our discussion of ordinary least squares by talking about multiple output linear regression. Um, unfortunately, more terminology, but what this means is basically when, the, when our model actually outputs a vector instead of a scalar. So this f function will, out, will take as input a vector x and then outputs a vector v, v hat. And in the, linear, in the linear model, we simply have a matrix W multiplied by X. Um, we can kind of write down the matrix W using uh, M different rows of the vector WI. 
Okay, again, we're gonna kind of hide the B's in here um, and usually define X to be, ha define X to have a one at the very end. That just makes the notation a bit simpler. So basically, um, this W matrix times X, will the way we do that, again, just to, for a sanity check, go across the, for the first element of V, we go across the first row of W and down the, down the vector X, multiply and add. Right, and then second row with X. So that's another inner product. And then, so that gets us the second element of V, V hat. Okay, and, and so on. So hopefully we don't need to go over this again. So multiple output linear regression, uh, not to be confused with what you might what you might see as multiple linear regression. So they're actually they're actually different. Um, so sometimes people will say multiple linear regression to mean when when the input is actually when the input has multiple variables. So basically, when x is a vector. Um, so you may hear that outside of machine learning, but in machine learning, when we say linear regression, I guess we always imply multiple linear regression in some sense, because in machine learning, the input is almost always multi-dimensional, right? So we, so we don't say multiple linear regression, we just say linear regression. Um, when the output is also multiple variables, we kind of emphasize the output, so multiple output linear regression. So in statistics, you may also uh, know this as a general linear model. So now let's kind of look at how we can uh, find the best matrix W that will uh, give us the best predictions. So now the output is a vector. We need to, um, so given the predicted output, the predicted output vector V hat, we need to construct a loss function that will measure how good the output is. And the loss function um, needs to be a scalar, right? So the, the loss function is always going to be a single number that tells us how good our predictions are. So the way we can convert the vector output to a scalar is by subtracting the predicted output from the data, which is also a vector. And then now vector minus vector gives us a vector we take the two norms squared of this vector difference to give us a scalar. So this is the, um, so this measures the error from the i theta point. We then sum over the error from the i theta point um, to, get, uh, to get the overall loss function. To expand things out a little bit, again, not gonna go through this in great detail because we have done basically the same thing. Um, now just in vector form, right? When the output is a vector. So V hat is going to be in general, some model F of X I, uh, yeah, V I hat is equal to F of X I uh, and W, where the W is a matrix of weights. In the case of multiple linear regression, we have a linear function for F. So that's going to be capital W times X. That should be X I here. So X I for the I theta point, I input, So now, again, we're not gonna kind of go through the painful process of taking the Jacobian of this in without using matrix derivatives. So let's put everything in matrix form. For the input data, we're again gonna kind of transpose all of the inputs and stack them on top of each other to create the matrix X. Uh, for the output vectors, we're again gonna transpose all of them, stack them on top of each other, and that gives us uh, that gives us y, the matrix y. So when we stack them, kind of when we transpose them and stack them on top of each other, we can write it this way. Uh, sometimes it's also convenient to now look at kind of the columns of this matrix y and define each of the columns y1 to ym. Okay, so now the loss function L of the matrix W can be writ actually written as um, the Frobenius norm of Y minus XW transpose. So hopefully um, you can work this out on your own. So write down X, write down W transpose, um, 
and then we have the w being like this before right so you can always write out w in the vector kind of write the matrix as a bunch of vectors inside and hopefully you can see that um y minus xw transpose the squared Frobenius norm would would be equal to our loss function okay and and this is actually equal to y the vector y which is the columns of the matrix y uh, minus x wi the wi being defined back here so that's equal to the two norm squared of all of them added together so remember the Frobenius norm is actually the sum of squares uh, the squared Frobenius norm is the sum of squares of all the matrix elements so uh, please refer back to the norms slide uh, just to get a refresher if you if you don't remember So now we can actually um, use a very similar approach by taking derivatives, finding the critical points, and then convincing ourselves that L is actually a convex function, right? So we're not going to do all of that. But uh, the optimal matrix W transpose, so it's called W star transpose, is actually equal to X transpose X inverse X transpose matrix Y. So this looks very similar to um, the single output case, so where we basically had the same expression, right? Except that our our y was a vector. Now y is a matrix. Okay, let's take a ten minute break, and afterwards we're gonna actually look at a practical example uh, in Python.
Okay, so now let's look at a simple coding example. Actually, maybe not so simple. Um, we're going to be coding up everything we learned about ordinary least, least squares. Um, so in this class, I'm going to assume that you guys know Python pretty well, uh, especially NumPy. Um, so I'm not really going to explain the code that much. I'm going to focusing. I'm, I'm going to focus more on the concepts of machine learning and how what we have learned translates to code. So here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> so we're first going to create a synthetic data set. So obviously, um, in the real world, a lot of times we don't really generate our data set, right? We, we actually have a data set that we collect from the real world rather than uh, kind of generating a synthetic data set. Um, but yeah, for simplicity, that's what we're going to do first. And second, uh, we're going to apply ordinary least squares to this synthetic data set. After that, we're going to introduce something called polynomial features. Um, so as you recall, in ordinary least squares, our model is just a linear function. But it turns out that with polynomial features, we can actually use ordinary least, least squares um, uh, to, to, uh, to, to have uh, kind of nonlinear, uh, to have nonlinear mappings bet uh, between the input and the output. So the relationship between x and y could actually be nonlinear. Um, even though we're using ordinary least squares. And lastly, we're going to be looking at hyperparameters, and a big part of hyperparameters is model selection. Um, so if some of these words don't make sense to you yet, don't worry about it. We'll cover, uh, we'll cover all of this. Okay, let's start with part one. So for part one, uh, we're just going to generate some data from a polynomial. So that means that our ground truth data will be actually, the ground truth model is actually a polynomial. And then we're going to just take a look at our data. Okay. So this is our polynomial. So what we're going to do is we're going to sample xi. So that's the input uniformly between minus one and one. So after we sampled some xi, we're going to plug the xi into this polynomial, negative 0.1 xi to the fourth minus 0.4 xi to the third uh, minus 0.5 xi squared plus 0.5 xi plus one, and then plus this epsilon, epsilon um, where epsilon is actually uh, um, a, normal, uh, a normally distributed random variable with mean of zero and variance of 0.1. So basically, we have a polynomial, but then we're going to add, add a little bit of noise, uh, epsilon i. And then the result is what we're going to call yi. Okay, again, not really going to go over the code very much. Um, basically, this is just a function um, for defining a polynomial. Okay, and then I, I guess we have to run this anyway. You guys can go through the code a bit, little bit more slowly uh, on your own time. Okay, I'm not a robot. Uh, okay, so this is kind of where we're generating the data. We're going to enter our coefficients. And then we're going to call the polynomial data function, which has which is basically generating some uh, uniformly distributed x, and then it's going to compute a polynomial. After it computes the polynomial, which is the part here without epsilon, it's going to add epsilon times a standard normal random variable. So that gives us our noisy polynomial. And here, uh, the result x, y are going to be returned uh, in here. Okay. And we're going to generate, in this case, 50 data points. Okay, let's run it. So now we have our x and our y. And let's just kind of quickly, quickly look at what we have generated. <clears throat> okay, so you can do some easy print statements. So let's print the shape of x. So shape of x is 51, y is 50. So that's good. We have 50 data points. And then we can 
uh, kind of print just five of the data points. So here we have the five of the X values and then the corresponding uh, five Y values. Okay, so in this case, basically we have that our input and output are both scalar, just to keep things simple. Obviously looking at the numerical values is not so illuminating. So let's try to plot the polynomial. Uh, again, uh, hopefully you're already familiar with how to plot things in Python. So I'm not really going to go over this code. So here, this is a plot. The plot calls the plot, call, uh, plot polynomial function. Okay, and then, so the plot polynomial function will actually plot the exact polynomial here without any noise. So this is going to be shown as the red curve here. At the same time, we're going to do a scatter plot of the x, y values that we generated. So this is a noisy data that we had. Okay, so this is what it looks like. The ground truth polynomial, and then the noisy data points that we generated based on this polynomial. So the idea is that we have all of these x and y points. Can we find um, can we construct a model that will try to take as input any of these x values and try to predict the correct y value, which is hopefully close to, um, close to this polynomial here. Okay, so that brings us to part two. So now we're going to use ordinary least squares. Okay, so first, so first we're going to be coding up uh, a pretty naive implementation of ordinary least squares and then see how well it works. Spoiler alert, it's not actually going to work that well. Um, so what we're going to do afterwards is talk about polynomial features, but uh, let's code up the simple Im implementation first. Okay, so this is the math from before. This is our loss function, L of W equals sum over data points of yi so the yi's are basically going to be uh, all these all these y values the values of these green points along the vertical axis here so that's all the y values stacked on top of each other and then we're summing yi minus w transpose xi in this case xi is just going to be scalars so they're going to be the horizontal values so the values on the horizontal axis of all the green data points Okay, and then we have seen before that we can actually write this as a two norm. A lot of times, because uh, the more data points you have, the more error you will have. So if I had 1000 data points, all of these errors will add up. So a lot of times, instead of using the squared loss that we used, um, it's pretty common to use mean squared error. Basically, simply dividing this, uh, this loss function by one over n. So this is the average error from every data point. So the key thing is that um, the w that minimizes our original loss function is going to be the same w that will minimize this loss function divided by n. Dividing by a constant doesn't really change where the minimum of a function is, right? The whole function is simply going to be squashed down by a factor but the minimum value and where uh, kind of the location of the minimum value is not going to change. Okay, so w star equals argmin over w of l tilde. So this modified mean squared error loss function, which is also equal to argmin over w of l. That's actually what we want. And of course, we've already done the hard work. Um, we know what W star equals to. It's X transpose X inverse X transpose Y or X dagger Y, where X is just all of the data points uh, transpose and then stacked on top of each other. And our Y is all the output data points uh, stacked on top of each other. In our case, uh, actually X is just a scalar. So uh, if we transpose, it doesn't really do much. Okay, but maybe we can, yeah, uh, so maybe we can code this up now. So this least squared function, first we just do x transpose x. 
and then so we have to input x right that's this x here and then we take the inverse and then w will just be x transpose x inverse times uh, x transpose y right so hopefully uh, you're going to be somewhat familiar with python and numpy so um you guys can look up these these functions uh, on your own time so i'm not really going to go over them in detail as i mentioned okay so we have defined this function which takes as input our data stacked and then it's going to output the best weights and this other function average loss will calculate the kind of the, the average loss, the basic basically L tilde. So what it does is it's gonna do y hat equals w transpose x. So w transpose x is the, the same as the dot product. And then the mean will just be y minus y hat to the power of two. And the kind of the average of all of that. Okay, so this is our very simple imp implementation. Okay, so now let's take a look at how well it works. So just a reminder, so y hat equals wx plus b, in this case, we have a scalar input and output. So this is the same as y hat equals w transpose x, where the w will include the b here, and the x vector actually includes x and 1. So actually, um, so actually, even though our x is a scalar, we can still make use of the vector notation. And all of these functions actually were coded for vectors with all the dot product notation, uh, the dot product, uh, as well as the inverse function. So what we're going to do first is to stack up our data points. So it's going to be, uh, so basically this matrix is going to have two columns. The second column will be all ones because we're going to put x and then one and then we stack them vertically right so so basically the way we're going to do that in python is going to be we actually write that we're going to write down x uh, as a actually we're going to have a column of ones first and then we're going to put the the stack of x beside it so now that we have um, constructed our x we can now call the least squares function so remember our y's um so in sorry in the math here we have to stack the y's but in our code we already have y as stacked up right because we have generated this data from the polynomial data function and this function actually generates vectors of x and y i mean the a complete list of x and y so the only reason we need to do some stacking for x is that this stacked, this stacked x needs to be put beside a column of ones. Okay, so hopefully you can follow that. If not, this code is here for you to run on your own time as well. Okay, so we were here. So we get our linear coefficients. That's basically calling this function, which gives us uh, the best w. Given our model, of course, um, by the way, we know that this is not the correct model because the data was generated using uh, a fourth uh, a fourth degree polynomial. So this model is actually only a first degree polynomial, a linear function. In general, in real life, of course, you wouldn't know what class of functions uh, was the underlying function that generated the data, right? Um, we only know here because we're doing something, well, it's just a very simple example here. Okay, so we get our linear coefficients and then we compute the loss. And then we're just gonna plot the results. So again, um, the, these data points, they're the same from as before. It's the same set of data points. And then our, uh, our model is basically saying, okay, if you give me an X, I'm gonna predict this value of Y. So this line represents the trained model. So the model with the optimal W. As you can see, it doesn't really work that well, right? There's some data points with a large amount of error, um, even though the center is not too bad. Uh, but more importantly, qualitatively, 
we can see that the data points have some kind of curve to it, uh, to them. But our model is actually a linear function, which of course cannot capture this curvature. So the mean squared loss is actually 0 0.04, around 0 0.04. Um, so remember that this is the squared loss, right? So average squared loss is 0 0.04. That means that the average loss, I mean the average error, the average deviation from, from the red line to the data points is around 0 0.2. And that kind of makes sense if you just look at, I mean, just look at this graph, right? The red line is here, some of these points are kind of off by almost 0 0.5 or even more. Some data points are pretty close. So kind of on average, you can believe that perhaps the average deviation is about 0 0.2. Okay, so that wasn't so precise, but hopefully you can get a qualitative idea of how much error there is. So how do we fix this? So now we're going to introduce polynomial features. We know that a linear function cannot fit the data. So can we construct a better model while still using ordinary least squares, which is something we know how to use? Okay. So actually we already started, started to do this. Previously, we knew that our data our input data x is a scalar and the output is a scalar. For convenience, we actually have defined x to be x1. So we define x to be a two-dimensional vector, even though the original data points, uh, those x's, the xi's, were actually uh, scalars, right? So for polynomial features, all we do is we continue doing this. Uh, to, uh, we, we're going to involve higher powers of x instead of just x itself. So instead of defining x to be x1, we're going to define the vector x, our input, to be 1x, x squared, all the way up to x to the power of d. So this is called choosing a feature of the input. So we know that our input data is simply a scalar. What we're doing here is we're going to change the input data into something a bit more nonlinear, a bit more expressive, before performing any kind of training. So now if we define x this way, our model becomes y hat equals w transpose x, where x is defined like this. Um, w then would also have uh, more components. In fact, if we write this down, uh, w would actually be, uh, w would be a vector involving wi's up to w1, w2, all the way up to wd. Uh, actually, here's kind of a mistake. So this should actually say, uh, so W is actually just W, W1 all the way to WD, but uh, this should really say, yeah. Y hat equals W transpose X equals sum from I, sum of I from one to D of WI XI, X to the power of I. So now our model is actually linear. So how can we use ordinary least squares for uh, a nonlinear model. So this is a very important point. Uh, so the important part of the model is that the model is linear in W. The model actually doesn't need to be linear in the input data, right? So the model is not really linear in X, but that's okay. Remember W is the unknown that we're trying to determine, whereas X is going to be given. No matter how complicated you make x, um, we can always calculate these from the data because x is known, right? As long as the unknown is linear, as long as our model is linear in the unknown w, we're going to be able to use um, ordinary least squares. It's as if it's basically as if our input data was just a longer vector. That's all. Nothing else changed. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, previously. We kind of had this line with augmented x, and we're stacking some things. So now we define another function which will make x look like this. 
Okay, so um, actually it turns out to be pretty easy to do. So this function will turn the raw data x into the features, into these features. And then we can code up something. Uh, yeah, we can code up something pretty simple. So first we create our features from the from the data. And then we simply call the least squares function that we defined before up here. So the least squares function doesn't really care what your x and y are as long as uh, as long as they're kind of compatible. So that means that y should be all the output data points should have the same dimension, right? All the input data points should have the same dimension. So we call least squares, get our w, and then we can now again use the same function to compute the average loss. Okay, and then in this case, we're going to just do plotting right away. Okay, so this function is actually pretty flexible. We can input our data, and then we can also input what, to, what degree of polynomial do we want. So that's basically this D here. So when we, so now, uh, in this plot, we still have all the green points. That's the original data points from before. So now, uh, so that's in green. So, okay. So then we also plot the ground truth polynomial in blue. So the blue is the polynomial that generated the data. And the red is the polynomial that we got from determining the optimal coefficients w. Okay, so we can kind of see that the red curve, which is our model, is a much better fit than the linear function. But of course, uh, it's not exactly the same as the ground truth polynomial that was used to generate the data. In this case, because there's some noise in the data points, I mean, just by inspection, it's kind of hard to say which one, like, uh, which function is a better fit for the data points. So now that kind of uh, begs the question, what degree, I mean, suppose we didn't know what the ground truth polynomial degree is, then how do we know what degree we should choose in our feature? in our polynomial feature. Well, this is what's called uh, choosing the right hyperparameter. So the parameters of our model are w, but we can only determine w after we have chosen d. So d is what, what's called a hyperparameter. They are not the parameters of a model. They are something else that basically defines what our model is, for example. So let's take a look at choosing hyperparameters, in this case, choosing, choosing the degree of polynomial in our feature. So again, uh, we, we just pick degree four back here because we know how the data was generated, but in practice, we wouldn't know the ground truth model. So now we have to pick, I mean, in reality, we need to be able to, we need, we need a process for choosing D. This is called model selection. Uh, different hyperparameter choices, different choices of D will result in different models. So actually, because we're coding is pretty easy. So let's just come back here and look at how we were able to fit a, uh, fit a polynomial, right? So we're just gonna do a for loop uh, going from 0th degree to 6th degree. Okay, so... Let's start from the beginning here. So this is the 0th degree. 0th degree is just a constant. So this is actually the best fitting constant to the data points. Obviously, it's not a very good fit. But I guess you can still see that ordinary least squares is working because this line is roughly, I mean, it's actually exactly the average value of all of these green points. Over here, we have the first degree polynomial that we saw. 
and then second degree. Right, so um, another thing to look at is the loss. So the zeroth degree has a very high loss comparatively because obviously it's not a very good fit. Um, the first degree polynomial has a better loss. Actually, we saw this loss earlier. Once we get to the second degree, you can kind of see that the loss is much less again. And visually, this seems like a really good fit already. And if you go to uh, degree three, the loss will actually decreases a bit further. And you can kind of see that, yeah, maybe visually it's a little hard to see. Maybe these last points are a little better, for example. Yeah, but it seems like we're already, maybe there's already diminishing returns here, right? If you keep going down degree four, you can kind of see that the loss is now not really changing very much, right? And visually again, right? It's not, I mean, I, I can't really tell the difference. Maybe if I put the, maybe if I put the plots on top of each other, I can see the difference, but so far I can't really see, see the difference. So we can kind of see maybe one difference is that the, our model is much closer to these points at the very end here, but it's actually unclear whether that should happen. Let me just go back quickly. Okay, I guess the, at the end is the, the blue curve is also pretty close. Okay. Yeah, but, but you get the idea. It seems like the higher degree we choose, we get better loss, right? Visually speaking, um, we get better fits, but soon we're, we're hitting diminishing, re diminishing returns. Okay, degree five. Again, we, we can see a slight wiggle down here. It's almost like... I mean, this slight wiggle may, might be due to the fact that there's a bunch of data points here, which is on the lower side. And then, yeah, so I think degree five was the highest that we went to. Okay, so we're kind of going, to, we kind of scrolled down uh, through all these plots, look, look, looked at our results qualitatively, and then also paid a little bit of attention to the loss. Uh, let's do things a little bit more quantitatively by actually plotting the loss as a function of uh, the degree of polynomial. So plot losses. Okay, so losses. So actually we're now going to do uh, degrees from 0 to 20, 20, 20, right? So range does not include the last one. Uh, the last number here. Okay, so let's do the plot. So on the y-axis is a log is a log scale of the loss, and on the x-axis is the degree of polynomial that we're using in our uh, or the highest degree of x in our feature d here. So one thing you notice is that the loss function in decrease, the loss decreases very rapidly as we go from zero to two. We already saw a bit of diminishing returns once we got to three, four, and five. That's right here. Um, actually, if you keep going up to higher and higher degrees, the loss actually keeps going down. So the loss never goes up as we increase the degree. And that's because we have more parameters. There are more components inside W for us to fit the data points better and better. So does that mean that we should always use degree 20 in our case, or maybe even higher? Well, let's be a little critical here and uh, look at what happens when you fit um, a polynomial of degree 20 to our data. So you can kind of see this all this wiggling, which is, which, which is basically saying that our model is trying to follow every data point pretty closely and at the end it kind of shoots straight down, right? So intuitively, it seems like this, maybe there's something not right here. Okay, let's maybe instead of looking at degree 20, let's just look at degree 10, right? Maybe it's a bit more reasonable. Okay, you can see that there's less wiggling, but there's still wiggling. Um, it goes sharply down and then yeah, and anyway, this also also looks like maybe this shouldn't be happening, right? Our model 
um, our model seems to be following the data points very sensitive sensitively. Okay, and now going back to degree five, it seems like this looks more reasonable, at, at least intuitively. So then basically that means that choosing the right model, in our case, choosing the right D is not as simple as simply looking at this blue curve, the loss versus degree curve and picking the lowest, right? So, it, so somehow we can't pick 20, 10 is already too much. Five might be reasonable. Okay, so let's take a look at why this happens first before we suggest some ways of choosing the, the right degree. So we're gonna go back to the theory, the math that we did. So W star equals to X dagger Y, where X dagger is actually V, uh, v sigma inverse U transpose. So this is how, what we talked about. How do you compute the pseudo inverse using SVD? So let's take a look at the singular values of x. That means the diagonal entries of sigma. So let's uh, let's do it for the degree twenty case first. So we're gonna um, we're gonna construct the vector. Uh, we're gonna construct the matrix x here. So so then with fifty with fifty data points, uh, our matrix x uh, has fifty rows and uh, sorry. Yeah, 50 rows and 21 columns. Okay, so now let's use SVD. So we can do that directly in Python. And we see that, uh, so actually in Python, we have three outputs. This The center output, the center matrix is actually sigma. So when we look at the minimum of the list of singular values, we see that it's actually 1.78 times 10 to the power of negative 7. So this is a pretty small value, very close to 0. Let's contrast it with um, fifth order polynomial. So, so let's construct uh, fifth degree polynomial features. And then look at the singular value. So now the singular value is actually, the minimum singular value is actually 0.17. So this is a much larger number than this one. This one almost looks like there's some kind of numerical error, right? This is practically zero, but not quite. Whereas here, the minimum singular value in this case is clearly not zero. This very small singular value means that X transpose X is very close to being non-invertible. So when you compute the inverse, you have to do one over this number, and then you're going to get a very, very large number. And uh, with, floating, uh, with floating point uh, calculations, there could be very large errors when you do this. OK, so because we're going to compute w, because the computation of w star involves some inverse, and the inverse involves taking the reciprocal of a very, very small number, that will basically suggest that W must have some very, very large values. And indeed, if we do the fitting again, and then, and then just print the largest W in the 20th degree polynomial, we can see that uh, the largest coefficient is actually 16, uh, 164,500 something, right? So that's really, really big. Whereas the coefficient is much more reasonable uh, when we did a fifth degree polynomial fit. So just close to one. And by the way, just to recap a little bit, our, um, our, our ground truth polynomial is actually, I mean, if you look at the coefficients, there's nothing crazy here, right? 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 1. There's nothing crazy here. Um, so even though the data generation process has no crazy coefficients, um, our degree 20 polynomial leads to very, very large coefficients because some of the single values are very, very small. Okay, so 
small singular values causes large values of w. And that also makes sense if you look at a plot, right? When w is very large, that means that one of the powers of x is being multiplied by a large number. So remember that our model, sorry to scroll around so much, but our model, this is our model. If one of the w's is very large and it gets multiplied by a, some power of x, that means that even when x changes very, very little, the overall y, the overall prediction, might change a lot. Right, so large coefficient here means that a small change in x could lead to a large change in y. So the predicted output is very sensitive to small changes in the input. And we see exactly this in the 20th degree polynomial. I mean, all this wiggling is one thing, but at the end, it sharply drops down. For the 10th degree polynomial, we can see a similar thing as well. There's more wiggling, there's more sensitive sensitivity of the output to small changes to the input. Okay. So, th uh, so this means that the model is actually not robust to the noise in the input. So let's take a look at generating more new data. A lot of times in machine learning, we have some data that we use to train a model, in this case, obtaining the best W. But then uh, after we have the best W, we may want to try to do predictions on as new input data comes in, right? So here we're gonna look at, we're gonna study what happens with new data using kind of using these the polynomial models. So let's just generate a bunch more data. Let's say 50 more data points, x new, y new, and let's plot them. So we have uh, the blue one, the, uh, sorry, the green data points are from the, are the last set of data points. And then the blue data points are the new ones that we just generated. And then we're gonna do a new regression. Uh, so we're, we're, what we're gonna do here um, is we're gonna fit a polynomial to the new data. Okay, so uh, let me just make sure we're, what we're doing here. Uh, so here we obtain features just like before, and then we obtain the best W given the features and Y. So that was the old data. And then we compute the loss. Next, we, con we construct a new set of data, a new set of features, and then we evaluate, uh, we evaluate our predicted, uh, our predictions using the W that we obtained earlier from training. And then we're gonna see how well our predictions are when we apply, when we apply our model to these new values of X, right? So that's feature new. So let's take a look. Okay, so in this case, we have fit we have obtained, uh, we have used the polynomial of degree five. We have fitted the, the, that degree five polynomial to the original data. So that was up here. And the red, uh, the red curve is what, we, what it looks like. Basically, it's actually the same as before. And now we're gonna do the same thing for our degree 20 polynomial. So again, it's something that we saw before. You can kind of see that up here, it's kind of reasonable, right? It seems like our model is fitting well to both the green and the blue data points, even though W is actually determined only from the green data points. So that's actually what we want. We want our model to be able to do a good job at predicting new, uh, our, uh, new data. Whereas the degree 20 polynomial is not so good. The degree 20 polynomial is kind of following all the green points very closely so sometimes it actually does a pretty bad job at predicting the blue points. Actually here is not even that bad. I think we got a bit lucky here. Um, but you can imagine at that if there were, if there were like a green point up here, or maybe a green point here, so a blue point here or a blue point over here, 
you will have a very bad loss, right? Okay, so some terminology. So the old data, which we have access to, so we can use that data for training. It's called training data or train data. New data that we don't have access to when we are doing training is called testing data or test data. When we were uh, uh, in the early part of this code, we were computing the loss uh, after we obtained W, right? The loss on the old data is known as the training loss or train loss. And the loss on the new data is the testing loss or test loss. So in this case, um, in a, with the fifth order polynomial, we can kind of see that the training loss and the testing loss might be similar. Whereas uh, in the degree 20 polynomial, the training loss is very small, but the testing loss could be very large, even larger than a testing loss in this case. So what we really want uh, is for the test loss to be pretty low because that means that if our testing loss is low, that means that when we when we're fed un, when we're fed new data, we're likely to make a good prediction. So the testing loss should approximate the loss we expect the model to incur when it's fed new data. And ideally, we want both the training loss and the testing loss to be low. When this is the case the model is set to generalized to the testing data. So this polynomial generalizes to the new blue set of data, even though it was not trained on the blue data. It was trained on the green data, meaning the W was determined from the green data. In the second case, the testing loss is much higher than the training loss. Usually this means that the model is fitted too well to the training data. It's following the training data too closely. It shouldn't do that because the training data actually had noise in it when we synthesized it, right? In the real world, data is always going to be noisy as well. So, so when it follows, when it fits the old data too well, it, when it fits the training data too well, then it will have very uh, high testing loss. It fails to generalize to the testing data. This is called overfitting. Okay, in the last case, when the testing loss is similar to the training loss and both of those losses are high, that means that perhaps the model is just not a good model. The model is not able to fit the data, fit to the data very well. So in this case, we say that it's underfitting. So basically, when we choose, uh, let me scroll up quickly, maybe over here, when the degree of the of the feature is too low, then we have underfitting, even though I haven't really shown you the test loss here, right? But hopefully you can imagine that if I generated some new data, the blue data points, um, well, this, this red line is not going to fit very well to the blue points. So both the test and tra training loss are very high, underfitting. For these models, probably these models, we would say that they generalize to the new data and then some of these uh, some of these fits are actually overfitting to the training data. Okay, let's go back down here. So overfitting, underfitting, this is definitely one consideration, and it's something that we should definitely analyze whenever we fit a model. But there's another uh, there's another thing that we should uh, study, which is instability. So let's take a look here. So let's begin with the fourth degree polynomial. Okay, so uh, so here we actually have two sets of data. They are both in green color, unfortunately, but if you look closely, the data points are different. So the first set of data points is actually x, y, the data points that we generated all the way up there and then the x new y new is the most most recently generated data, generated data points so we fit a degree 4 polynomial to them and the result looks pretty similar right the fit looks pretty similar 
What happens when we do the same thing to the 20th degree polynomial? With the first set of training data, the, polyno the polynomial looks like this, but with the second, uh, when we fit a 20th degree polynomial to the second set of data, it actually looks like this. So you can kind of see that the model changes a lot depending on what data is fed in. So this is called instability. So instability is another sign of overfitting. So the first sign of overfitting is really good training error, but potentially bad, but, uh, but bad test error. Another, so, so this instability is another sign of, of overfitting. You can kind of see that uh, if we generated, uh, like maybe in this region of the model, we can kind of expect the test error to be very bad as well. Okay, let's continue a little bit more. Okay, so all of this was done using 50 data points. So let's take a look at more data points. So here I'm gonna generate another, generate another set of data points, this time 200 data points. I'm gonna call the data points X big, Y big. And we're gonna be fitting a bunch of uh, models. So degree five, degree 10, degree 20. And let's take a look at the results. Degree five over here, degree 10 over here. You can see that the degree 10 is much better than the previous degree 10 when we had less data points. And then even the degree 20 is, well, actually it's still pretty bad, but at least the degree 10 is not too bad, right? The, the, the degree 20 is just a, lo a lot more wiggling that shouldn't be there. Okay, so this kind of tells us that when we have more data points, um, we're less likely to overfit when we use a model with many parameters. Okay, let's go back to the discussion about how to pick the right degree of polynomial. Okay, so actually, yeah, maybe we can just about finish this. So here I'm going to, um, so previously I had this blue curve, which was showing the training loss. Now I'm gonna be adding this red curve, which is the testing loss. So this is a loss. So this is basically, if we go up here, this is how well this model in red, which was determined from the green points, how well, how much error uh, this model has when we compare it to the blue points, so the new set of data. Okay. So we can see that, again, training loss keeps going down because the more parameters we have, the more our model can follow the data points but the test loss is uh, kind of evaluated on a new set of data, right? And we kind of see that the test loss is actually slowly increasing. Um, it's not really monotonic, but roughly speaking, the trend is that the test loss is increasing as we continue to increase the degree of the polynomial. So perhaps the best place is somewhere around here, around degree three, four, five or so, maybe six. Coincidentally, the minimum loss is actually over here. But in general, that may not happen. Uh, when you do model selection, it kind of depends on how much noise there is in the data, right? So, so in general, it may be very difficult to pick exactly the right model. But hopefully we, hopefully we won't be way off, like all the way out here. Okay, so I think, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll just say a little bit more and then we can finish for today. So this gap between the red and blue lines is called the general generalization gap. When we have a very large generalization gap, that's a, an indication of overfitting. Um, so unfortunately, uh, so, so for example, I kind of mentioned that we should be picking a model around here, right? But if we're picking a model around here, that means that we have already used information in the red curve to determine what model we should pick. 
So actually, it sounds like a benign thing to do, but this is a pretty critical thing that、uh, we should not do because earlier we said that the test loss is supposed to be an approximation of how well the model will do when we evaluate the model on an, on new data, right?、Um, the new data should never be used in any way to determine our model, including the hyperparameters. So, so, so that's why、uh, actually, if we pick, if we use the red curve to determine、um, what model we should pick, then the test loss will no longer be accurate. It will no longer accurately reflect how how well our model will do to new data. So what we need to do would be actually to use validation sets, and that's where we're going to pick up next time. So thanks everyone. I'll see you guys next time.